5 Creepy Freaky Unexplained Mysteries So as we are nearing the time of Halloween when creepy and spooky stories get shared, thought I would share 5 of the creepiest and freakiest unexplained mysteries which I find fascinating. 1. The Story of Lorena Garcia How different would it be if you would have taken that out-of-state job offer that one time? What about those few seconds that delayed you that morning of that horrible accident? An accident you narrowly avoided being part of. In our world there are infinite possibilities in our everyday decision making, however we get to only live out in one set of possibilities. True or false? Yes or no? Take the job, or don't. But if we drop down into the minute world of quantum mechanics, then the possibilities exponentially increase. Quantum superposition is the principle in quantum mechanics that states that any two or more quantum states can be added together, resulting in another valid quantum state. In other words, an atom can be excited or not at the same time. Or it could be in two position, also at the same time. On July 16, 2008 a woman by the name of Lerina Garcia Gordo posted a comment in an online forum asking for help. The 41-year-old Spanish woman claimed to have woken up in a parallel universe. A world not unlike the one she had left before going to sleep. However small inconsistencies in various aspects of her life began to convince her that she was in fact, living in an alternate reality. This is the story of Lerina Garcia Gordo, the woman who claims to be from a parallel universe. On the morning of July 16th, Lerina awoke to find that her bed sheets were of a different color. She was confused and disturbed at the fact that they were of a completely different set. It wasn't just the colors that were different. Not being able to come up with a rational explanation, Lerina decided to get ready and head to her office job. A job that she had been employed for the past 20 or so years. Her car was in the same spot she had left it the night prior. She got in and drove off commuting down the same path she had grown accustomed to since moving into her apartment seven years ago. Besides the bedsheet, everything else seemed normal for Lerina. That is until she arrived at her office. Inside the office building there were a few strange people she had not met before but that didn't raise any flags. Lerina walked towards her own office only to discover that there was a different name tag on her office door. It wasn't her name. She then thought that maybe she had gotten off on the wrong floor of the building however a quick look revealed that she was on the right one. She had gone to the right office, it was just that her name had been replaced. Lerina was confused. Had she gotten fired and no one told her? After 20 years of faithful work, this is how they let her know? She took out her laptop and connected to the company's wireless network. The she found that she was still on the company's roster however it showed that she was under a different manager, in a totally different department. Her head was in a tailspin. She immediately checked her credit cards, driver's license, and work ID. They all reflected the right information as far as she knew. Same name, same picture, same numbers, and same home address. Not knowing what to think. She called her job and told her she was taking a sick day. The inconsistencies that morning made her think that something was wrong medically with her. She took the rest of the day off and headed straight to the doctor's office. There they ran tests on her, checking for signs of any illicit drugs in her system. The tests came back negative. She had no alcohol or drugs in her system. Lerina went back home and began going through her personal files bank statements, personal checks, bills dot dot she double checked them all. They all showed the right information. So a thought popped into her head. What if this is amnesia? What if something happened to me and I can't remember parts of my life? Immediately she logged online and began scouring the internet. She saw that the news and top stories were the same as the previous night, so there were no missing days. As far as Lerina knew, she had woken up living a slightly different life. It had been six months since Lerina had left her boyfriend of seven years. She had recently started dating a man, Agustin, that lived down the street from her. They had been dating for only four months, 
however she knew him quite well. When she called her new boyfriend's number, someone else picked up. They told Lerina that there was no one with the name Magustin, or that matched her description living in that house. The news shocked her as she had spent the last four months getting to know the guy. She had even met his son and had started to develop a relationship with him as well. But now, there were no signs of her boyfriend and his son at all. As the day passed, she found more and more inconsistencies. She had no choice but to go into work the next day and pretend that she belonged. Still, Lerina called and called but no one had heard of Agustin or his son. It was as if they never existed. That's when she learned that she had never left her ex-boyfriend. That they had been together since seven years ago and there was no sign of them having ever separated. Lerina didn't know what to think. What had happened to the life she knew? What had happened to her career? Had she hallucinated it all? The one thing she thought was that maybe she had a nervous breakdown at one point. Severe enough to implant false memories into her head, or at least that's what she thought when she visited a psychiatric clinic. However tests concluded that she was of healthy body and healthy mind. The doctors told her that maybe she was under a lot of stress and could have hallucinated it all. An explanation she had thought about but knew wasn't true. She set out to look for her boyfriend Agustin, but came back empty-handed. A hired investigator concluded that there were no signs of Agustin or his son in that city. Her own family thought that Lerino was going insane when she asked about her younger sister's shoulder operation. They looked at her with confusion as Lerino insisted that her sister had recently had surgery on her shoulder. A claim that no one in her family could back up. As far as her family knew, there had been no surgeries done to any member of the family. Days, weeks, and months passed as Lerina began to discover small but unnerving differences in her life. Clothing in her drawers and closets that she didn't remember buying, blog posts she had made weeks, even days before, were gone. Emails and chats were no longer archived in her computer. However browsing through news sites and blogs, the world appeared to be the same. Just like she had remembered before going to bed that July night. As the months passed and no answers could be found, Lerina became convinced that she had simply just gone to bed one night and awoke in a parallel universe. A world in which her life had been altered by small decisions of her past. Having sought medical attention Lerina knew that no one would believe her ordeal. So she did what anyone in her position would do, make a post in an online forum about her ordeal and ask for help. 2. The Man from Torrid the man from Torrid, sometimes referred to as the Torrid Mystery or the Man Without a Country, is a story about a man who arrives at a Japanese airport from a country called Torrid. Many people have claimed this story to be true, so the crux of the problem pertains to Torrid. One would notice that there is no country by the name of Torrid, either today or during the purported period of time when the incident took place, that is the 1950s. The story ends with the man disappearing, forever, a day after arriving in Japan. Moreover, all of his personal documents, such as his passport and driver's license also, conveniently, disappeared, thus making this strange story unsolvable. The man's arrival. The story of the man from Torad begins quite specifically in many sources with a hot day in July 1954. On that particular day, a man was said to have arrived at Haneda Airport, known also as Tokyo International Airport. This man has been described as Caucasian looking with a beard. Whilst his primary language is said to have been French, it has been purported that he spoke Japanese and many other languages as well. So far, there is nothing extraordinary to note. The sequence of events then differs according to which version of the story one encounters. In one version, this man hands over his passport to be stamped, and the Japanese immigration officer notices something strange. Whilst the passport looked authentic, the country where it was issued, Torrid, was recognized as non-existent, either by the officer or one of his, her colleagues, indicating that the man should be taken away for interrogation. In another version, the man mentioned that he was from Torrid, 
and when the immigration officer did not believe him, he showed him, her his passport. Location of Torrid. The next part of the story details the man trying to convince the immigration officers that Torrid does indeed exist. According to the traveler, Torrid was located between France and Spain, and had by then been in existence for 1000 years. When shown a map, the man pointed to the area occupied by the Principality of Andorra, and was puzzled as to why his country was called Andorra on the map. Both sides refused to give in. The Japanese officers insisted that Torah did not exist, and the traveler argued otherwise. Vanished. Eventually, the man was held by the officers, as they were suspicious that he might be some kind of criminal. They brought him to a nearby hotel for the night, whilst they conducted their investigation. To ensure that the man did not escape during the night, two guards were placed outside his room. The next morning, when the officers went to the man's room, they realized that he had simply vanished, as there were no signs of his escape. Additionally, all of his personal documents, which may serve as evidence for the story's validity, had apparently disappeared as well. Travel through time or space? Or just an exaggeration? One of the most notable explanations for this incident is that the man from Torrid had somehow passed through a parallel dimension by accident, and ended up at Hanada Airport. It has been suggested that, based on this explanation, there is a parallel Earth which is similar to ours with the exception that the locations called Andorra here is known as Torrid over there. Another suggestion is that the man was a time traveler from the future, though this interpretation is arguably more problematic than the one supposing interdimensional travel. It has also been suggested that an incident like that did indeed happen, though perhaps much less sensational. This more mundane story could have been embellished each time it was told, so much so that it eventually evolved into the great mystery that it is known as today. Finally, it is also entirely possible that this story is merely an urban legend. The story of the man from Torrid might not have even occurred in the first place, and may have just been the creation of someone's imagination, nobody can knew. 3. The Methian Water Demon. It began one rainy night in October 1963, just when the Francis Martin family of Methuen, Mass, had settled down for a quiet evening of TV. A few minutes into the program they noticed a small damp patch forming on the den wall between two bookshelves. The spot grew quickly from the size of a nickel to that of a large dinner plate that sod. Francis Martin remembered telling his wife as he got up to investigate the curious spot. His first thought was that a pipe had frozen and burst. But that didn't seem possible since it was only early October. Nor did a drain backup seem likely either, since he'd had the system cleaned out only a few weeks before. What could the strange spot be, he wondered as he ran his fingers across the sticky surface of the wall. His wife and children joined him, and soon they were ooing and eyeing over their mysterious discovery. Then came a loud popping sound, like a small caliber pistol being discharged. A split second later a spout of water burst from the whale soaking them all wet. It pretty well drenched us, Martin told a reporter. The water was freezing cold, the coldest water I've ever felt. A few seconds later the gushing spray of cold water stopped. After cleaning up the mess, Martin promised his wife he would phone the plumber first thing in the morning. The next day, however, another spot appeared on a different wall. Soon a fountain of water was pouring in forcing the family to rearrange furniture to keep it from getting soaked. As before, the mysterious stream of icy water lasted about 20 seconds before suddenly stopping. After several days of popping sounds and mysterious fountains of water, usually occurring every 15 minutes at various places, the Martins' house was so much awash that they moved into the home of Mr. Martin's mother-in-law in Lawrence, not far from Methuen. Unfortunately, the water gremlin pursued them to Lawrence, and in a short time five rooms in the mother-in-law's place were drenched too. Water was everywhere, Martin recalled. The walls, carpets, furniture, everything was soaked. The deputy fire chief was asked to investigate and the house was checked for leaky pipes, 
There were none. At least one official a deputy named Maines, was present when a jet of water suddenly burst through a plaster wall and shot two feet into the room. He also heard the curious popping sound. It was like a nightmare, Martin told the press. If I didn't know any better, I'd think some kind of water demon was after us. Rather than inflict their problems on his mother-in-law any longer, Francis Martin loaded up his wife and kids and moved back to their Methian home. This time the water supply was turned off at the main and the pipes were drained. Their first night back home nothing happened. Then, next morning, another wall exploded in a shower of ice-cold water. Then another, and another. In the days that followed, damp spots would appear on several walls simultaneously. Then as suddenly as the spots had appeared, the whales would erupt with streams of water at the same time, none of them lasting longer than twenty seconds. Once again the house became unlivable, and once again the Martins returned to Lawrence. But, just like before the water demons followed them, eventually forcing them to return home. It was as if whatever was causing the problem was ordering us back home, Martin noted. It wouldn't tolerate us leaving our home in time the watery assaults on the Martin family gradually came to an end. A few more spots appeared, but no more leaks or showers shot forth from the walls. To their dismay, the Martins never did discover the source of their watery haunting. How, or why? gallons of water would suddenly jet from the dry plaster walls of their house would remain a mystery. Equally perplexing was the gradual cessation of the phenomena. Moisture buildup was the official explanation. To this day, however, no official has been able to explain how moisture buildup can result in showers of icy water gushing forth for 20 seconds. One psychic investigator theorized the bizarre activity was the work of a poltergeist a kind of troublesome ghost that takes delight in wreaking havoc in the lives of mortals. This particular poltergeist probably favored working with water. The investigator noted dryly. A true water demon. 4. The Green Children of Woolpit Once upon a time in the quiet English village of Woolpit, something very peculiar occurred. Animal snares were set up around the village to keep woodland creatures at bay. But one day, rather than trapping wolves, a different kind of trespasser fell prey to the pits. Two abandoned children, with skin as green as leaves. It was harvest time in the 12th century community of Woolpit. The village was located in one of England's more populous agricultural regions. Yet its inhabitants still clung to their pastoral roots, and their love of folklore. The villagers were going about their daily duties when they came upon the children, one boy and one girl. The pair spoke in a bizarre tongue and wore clothing that no one had seen before. A few villagers pulled the green children from the pit while others brought them something to eat. They refused all food but raw beans. A landowner named Sir Richard de Cain took in the foundlings and soon had them baptized. Yet the little boy struggled to adapt. Not long after their arrival in Woolpit, he fell ill and died. The young girl, however, survived, and began learning English. Once her vocabulary grew big enough, she relayed her story to the villagers. The little girl and her brother hailed from St. Martin's Land. It was a region forever cloaked in twilight, and surrounded by a swirling river. Everyone in St. Martin's Land was green. Gazing across the river, they spied another land far brighter than their own. How exactly the siblings arrived on the other side, she was unable to explain. The little girl claimed they were tending to her father's cattle when they discovered a cave. They entered the narrow opening, crawling deeper into the darkness. Suddenly there was a flood of light, brighter than anything they could imagine. It was then that the green children tumbled headfirst into the pit. The girl remained in Woolpit where she found work as a servant in Sir Richard de Cain's house. Eventually she rechristened herself Agnes and married a royal official named Richard Barr from the town of King's Lyon, 40 miles outside Woolpit. The tale of the green children was first recorded by two English writers, Ralph of Cogchchall and William of Newburgh. William's report was published in the Historia Romanglicarum, 
where he indicates trustworthy sources were consulted. Ralph's account, published somewhat later, in his Chronicum Anglicanum, cites Sir Richard de Cana source. Both accounts differ slightly. Neither tale offers any kind of real explanation. Modern researchers offer up numerous theories about the green children of Woolpit. The first, of course, is that it was an English folk tale about other world inhabitants, such as fairies or spirits. It certainly would not be the only ancient story from the English Isles that described strange beings entering the human realm through a woodland portal. Another theory suggests the fanciful tale is an exaggerated version of a true event of lost or kidnapped children. An even more obscure explanation involves extraterrestrials. Scottish astronomer Duncan Lunan theorized that the green children arrived from a faraway planet during a matter transmitter malfunction. As for their signature green tint, it came from the edible plants of their home planet, which represented their entire diet. Lunan even claimed he could trace the descendants of the green children of Woolpit to the present. Whether the green children came from another world or another world will never be known. What is known is that people love to pass down stories of the strange and mysterious, especially those that involve green children who always at their peas. 5. The Getaway Driver Back in the mid-1980s two police officers from Roanoke, Virginia, were on patrol duty in an unmarked police van. Just before twilight they spotted a suspicious-looking vehicle driving slowly through the neighborhood. They began to tail him but the driver spotted the police officers and took off at high speed. After being in pursuit of the vehicle for a while they realized the driver was heading towards Schaffer's Crossing, a 100-foot-long concrete railroad tunnel. The police officers were about 200 feet behind the vehicle when all of a sudden the driver lost control of the vehicle and smashed straight into the concrete archway of the tunnel bringing the pursuit to a stop. The officers were in shock as they both watched the vehicle smash into the archway and lift about two feet in the air completely destroying the vehicle. They remained in control of their own van and stopped a good few meters behind the crash. However just as shocked as they were to witness the vehicle smashing into the archway they were even more shocked to see the driver, a white male, about 5 feet 10 inches and about 180 pounds, crawl out of the vehicle's driver side window, seemingly unscathed and run off down into the tunnel. The two officers immediately gave chase after the man into the tunnel. The man was running hard but so were the officers and they never once lost sight of him. They kept on chasing him and got close enough to see him clearly, but all of a sudden he vanished. There were no exits in the tunnel. The officers examined every inch of the tunnel but they could not find any trace of him at all. The officers were confused as to what they just witnessed. Surely no one can just disappear into thin air. They headed back out of the tunnel towards the crash site and to their surprise they found the driver, the suspect, the same clothes, height, weight and features. The man they had just been chasing was sitting in the driver's seat of the smashed car. The steering wheel and the dashboard had crushed his chest probably killing him instantly. The police officers never did get their heads around to what they witnessed. They were asked by their supervisor to leave out all references of their chase on foot of the dead man from their report. Was the man so desperate to outrun the police that he carried on in the afterlife, 